and welcome to this evening event hosted by the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I am Naomi Slip, Chief Curator of the museum, and I am thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Michael J. Moore for this public lecture, organized to celebrate the recent publication of his book, We Are All Whalers, The Plight of Whales and Our Responsibility, released by the University of Chicago Press this month. Dr. Moore has a veterinary degree from the University of Cambridge in the UK and a joint PhD from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, HUI, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has been based at HUI in Woods Hole, Massachusetts since 1986, uh, where he is now a senior scientist. He is director of the HUI Marine Mammal Center and provides veterinary support to the Marine Mammal Rescue and Research Division of the International Fund for Animal Welfare supporting their work with stranded marine mammals on Cape Cod. His research encompasses the forensic analysis of marine mammal mortalities, especially in regard to the acute, accurate diagnosis of perceived human impacts and the prevalence of zoonotic agents, large whale health assessment at sea using unmanned aerial systems, the interaction of natural and man-made impacts on fish and marine mammal stocks, pathophysiology of marine mammal diving and development of systems to enhance medical intervention with large whales and technologies to reduce large whale entanglement. Put another way, <laughs> with over 40 years of field work with humpback, pilot fin, and in particular North Atlantic right whales, he has studied the effects of trauma from the shipping and fishing industries on large whale survival and welfare. He is currently working with stakeholders to reduce the threats of such trauma to these animals. His research agenda and personal experiences from graduate school to today, which he charts in his recent book, inform and contribute to the narrative focus of that text and the talk we will be treated to tonight. As a note, you can purchase the book online via a few different um, uh, sources, including the museum store. I believe Jocelyn Noons will be dropping that into the chat. If anyone has questions or comments throughout the talk, I'll be monitoring that. And otherwise, I'd like to hand it over now to Dr. Moore. Thank you. There we are. Can you see my screen? You can. Excellent. Well, good evening and welcome, and thank you for spending time with us tonight. I really appreciate it, and welcome in virtual to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, a place that I very dear to my heart, and I've been a trustee on and off here for 20 years and off right now, but here we are. So, I wrote a book. Why are we all whalers? Why are we responsible for that plight? I hope to answer that in the next half an hour or so, and then we'll get to do your questions, which are the most important part of the show, really. Uh, my background is, as you heard, I, I trained as a veterinarian and as a scientist, and I've been at Hui for quite a while. And I, since a college student, I've been fascinated by whales that are air-breathing, mammals living in the water. Sperm whales can dive for an hour or more on a single breath. Right whales don't dive that long, but they too have extraordinary adaptations for eating swarms of animals that are half the size of a grain of rice. So in this photograph on the right, you can see the arcade of the baleen, these horny plates that hang down. You can't see up through the front, but there's a big old cavern. And as they push through the water column with their strong tails and the, the muscular bodies and steer with these flippers, they, force the body through these clouds of copepods. And in doing that, they concentrate them at the back. There's a funnel and a filter. And the water comes out of the filter and the funnel gets a, a slurry of these copepods that go down into the body. And that's what they feed on. It's very oily. And it's, it's really important for these guys to be able to do that. So, at the beginning of the book, I, I, I give a quick overview of right whales in general through this map. And as you can see, there are three species, the North Atlantic right whale, which used to be common in Europe and around Iceland, as well as where they are now today, which is primarily between the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Florida. There's the North Pacific right whale and the Southern right whale. All three species were knocked down to a few hundred by whalers uh, by the middle of the 
1900s, excuse me. Uh, the southern right whales have done very well from those few hundred, they're now into tens of thousands. And North Atlantic right whale, not so much. We'll see how that's not been going so well. North Pacific right whale, it's quite a cryptic species, but they're not doing well either as far as we know. So they've been whaled for a hundred years. And what do I mean by we are all whalers? Well, the Basque went after them with harpoons in the Bay of Biscay, and they were taxing whalers for their income from baleen uh, a thousand years ago. But most recently, we've been killing the whales uh, by mistake, but we've still been whaling after them, and as much as whaling is defined as a, an act of ensnaring or catching a whale without any real intent being involved in that definition. So fishing gear entanglement and shipping collisions in recent decades have been a major part of their traumatic life. So this is another view of a right whale from a drone again. Um, you can see here the upper jaw with these white, thickened, horny, leathery patches, which we call callosities. Each one's unique for the individual. So if you take a photograph like this or from the side of it from a boat, you can then compare it to previous photographs and check out whether this animal has been seen before, and if so, where and when. And by doing that through the Newland Aquarium's catalog, we have been able to um, learn an all enormous amount of information about the life history of each individual whale and able to catalog the upswings and the downswings of the populations as a result. So you can see here again the Bailey. So while this video of a skim feeding right whale plays, uh, in fact, two right whales, um, I will um, read you the first piece I want to read you about, which is read to you, is from the beginning of the preface in the book. Recently, I spent an early April day in the southwestern corner of Cape Cod Bay in eastern Massachusetts in the United States with a friend. He had been at sea his entire life, but had never knowingly come close to a right whale. His day job was master of an oil tanker on the Valdez, Alaska to San Francisco, California run, where he might have been close to a North Atlantic right whale. He was vastly overqualified to skipper our boat, which he did while I piloted a small drone to measure the lengths and widths of the many feeding North Atlantic right whales we had found in a small area. There was no wind that day. The sea was like a mill pond. It was crisp, cold, sunny, and quiet. We shut down the motor, drifted, watched, and listened. As each animal surfaced, exhaled, and immediately inhaled, we listened to the unique cadence of their breaths, and we watched their steady progress through the water with their mouths wide open, filtering the clouds of food close to the surface. Periodically, they slowly closed on the boat, and we could see into their open mouths with small eddies of water peeling away from their lips. Much larger eddies formed in their wakes, and as their powerful tails and bodies pushed them along, they made tight turns, using their huge flippers and tails as rudders to keep themselves within the food patches. This went on all day. As the sun started to sink behind the cliffs on the nearby western shore of Cape Cod Bay, their creamy white upper jaws just visible above the surface turned to a vibrant golden hue. It was a peaceful, majestic, timeless sight and a huge privilege to be permitted to study these animals. So with that, I uh, just want to back off into a high level view of, of the book's plot uh, through this map that was drawn by Natalie Renier at the week. Beautiful work for the book. The, um, the work I did in the Faroe Islands with two colleagues as an undergraduate exposed me by mistake really to my first large whale that happened to be dead. Maybe that was a sort of foresight of where my career was going. But so the pilot whale drive in the Faroe Islands has been in recent news a lot and so there's some some discussion about it in the book i, I as i graduated from vet school I, I worked off a whaler in iceland uh, for six weeks uh, doing an observer job learning how rapidly they were able to kill these whales using explosive harpoons and uh, that sounds gruesome and it was uh, but it was also a foundation to the rest of my understanding that the book leads me through Worked in Newfoundland, Labrador, with Pal Whitehead, 
when I was an undergraduate. And then also in the Caribbean, so bank, the humpbacks again. But most of the book reflects my work with right whales and Gulf of Maine, Bay of Fundy, uh, and further south to mortalities all the way through Florida. But especially important to me in the book is, is the time that I spent in Uktiavik, it used to be called Barrow in Alaska, with Nupiat whalers, learning from them how to take whales apart efficiently without a lot of machinery, uh, with knives and ropes and hooks and so on. And in the book, and I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but I, I do um, investigate and explore the relationship that these native folks have and have had for millennia with these animals and how the habitat has survived. And as a result, the whales and the whalers have survived in mutual coexistence, which I think is a model for some of the problems we've got on the other side of the country here. So quickly, uh, this was a whaler, well, like the whaler that I spent time on. Uh, these harpoons have got explosive grenades on the front. And when they get close to a whale, they'll pull the trigger. And my job was to assess how long the animal took to die, along with a colleague who looked at the pathology of the shrapnel from the grenade. Gruesome. And at the time, I didn't really get a sense of why I was there. But Later, um, I did in hindsight. So this is a fin whale on the top left here that was uh, killed in that study um, in, in, in that year. We didn't kill it for the reason of doing the study, but it was a commercial kill. And it wasn't actually a particularly efficient kill. The harpoon didn't penetrate very well. So this was one of the longer running uh, events before the animal did die. But the uh, the study showed that explosive harpoons like this had a mean time from firing the shot to it dying of about four minutes or less than four minutes. So the bottom line here on the bottom photograph here is of, of a right whale that was killed by a passing very large ship cutting uh, propeller slices through the chest, uh, through the muscle and blubber, but especially into the chest and that killed this animal really very rapidly. And the top right photograph is a right whale that um, was entangled for about six months before it died. And you can see the flipper is all white under the water here. And there's a line going over the blowhole and it then went back around through the baleen. And it died a very skinny animal down in uh, Virginia after it was initially seen by the New England Aquarium entangled up in Nova Scotia. So, how does this all stack up? How do humans kill whales? Harpoons, about four minutes. Ships, minutes, usually sometimes hours. Rope, on average, around six months. So when I started to think through that and write about it, it came clear to me that it wasn't as clear cut as some folks might think in terms of here we are in our nice um, advanced society looking with a certain amount of disdain upon the nations that still kill whales with harpoons. And we weren't necessarily in a space of real um, credibility because of the fact that we were um, killing whales very slowly. And it's, it's complicated. It's very complicated. So how do we trap whales um, with rope, for instance? Uh, this is a schematic of Natalie's that shows uh, how the traditional way of, of harvesting lobster is to set one or more cages along the bottom. If there's multiple cages, it's called a trawl, and they're all attached to a ground line, which used to float, but one of the first things the government did was to remove the floating ground line and replace it with sinking ground line to remove that sort of whale trap that was there. But still the end line remains as a whale trap. And the offshore gear usually has a large float, uh, potentially with a high flyer as well, and then a pickup buoy beside it. Now these, rope, these buoys serve two purposes. One is to uh, signify where the gear is set on the bottom, but also as a handle to be able to pull the gear up to service the trap, to replace the bait and take out the harvest. So what happens when a whale gets entangled in rope 
uh, this this animal was almost certainly entangled in lobster gear. Um, there was a fragment of plastic covered wire on this long line here. These two photographs, same animal, you can check the callosities here. It was there's some difference in terms of how much uh, there was, how many, how many whale lice were on the head, but basically this match could be the same animal 10, 10 months apart. So this was in February and this is the following December. And the white line is the outline in, in February and the green, the red line is the outline in December. It's lost a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And this animal was not going to get pregnant simply because uh, as in Olympic athletes, uh, if you're very skinny, you're essentially infertile. And loss of weight from lethal and sublethal entanglements is a major concern for how the, the poor fertility of these animals has played out over the last few decades. So entanglement trauma can essentially suck the light out of whales as they pull gear behind them. So one of the things that I've done in uh, the book is those two postscripts where I've taken the history of a couple of different right whales that died from chronic entanglement and got myself in the head of the whale uh, through the work that I and others did to lay out the story and figure out how it died and why. So, you know, as a scientist, anthropomorphism is a cardinal sin. As a veterinarian, advocating for animals is what we're trained to do, diagnosis, treatment, prevention, but also advocacy. And so I talk about it in the book quite a bit, the sort of veterinary brain and the, and the, um, the science brain having interesting discussions at times. But ultimately, I came down to the idea that anthropogenic trauma demands anthropomorphism. So here we are, uh, spring 1993. And so this is the same animal as a calf, juvenile, healthy adult, entangled about. It's the one that I showed you just the previous slide. Life as a young right whale calf consists of sticking close to mom and doing what she says. Sometimes when mom is feeding deeper than I want to dive, I stay nearer the surface till she comes back up. Suckling is really important to get at all that oil-rich milk. 94 to 2002, I hung out with my mother for about a year. It took a while to learn how to feed on my own once I wasn't getting so much milk, so I lost some weight after I was weaned. But I gradually got the idea of how to swim through the water with my mouth wide open. It's really tiring to swim like that. We have to swim very hard to make progress through the water, and we have to be very picky about where we feed so that we can lay away more energy than we expend in catching the food. Learning to find the best places to eat was tough, but I found that I have an innate sense of where to go, how to find places that we know have been bountiful in years past. I grew in length and width and hung out with other right whales in large groups. One day I realized that I was pregnant, so it was time to head south to warmer waters. My first calf was born and it did well. 2004, once my calf was weaned, I went back to work building up my body condition, hoping to get fat enough to have another calf soon if I found good food, or some years later if I didn't. One of the things my mother had told me time and time again was to be wary of ships, boats, and fishing gear. The ships were very noisy and confusing because we could hear them for hours and hours as they got closer and we got to the point where we simply ignored them. Then usually as they went by, the noise slowly faded away again. But sometimes as it got louder and louder, the noise dropped off abruptly, which was a great but deceptive relief. My mother had explained that it meant that the bow of the ship was shielding the noise from the propeller and engine, which were at the back of the ship. Her advice was to dive as fast as possible to avoid being hit. My mother also warned me about rope. Fishing boats had all kinds of different ropes and nets. The ones that dragged nets weren't a major threat to us, but they did a number on the fish-eating whales and dolphins. The biggest issue for us was rope that went from the surface of the ocean to the bottom, where it was attached to one or more wire mesh cages containing crabs and lobsters. We also had to watch out for long curtains of nets stretched across along the bottom with weights to keep them in place and floats to keep the nets standing up in the water. When I was a calf, I used to try and play with ropes and I would get a serious telling off from my mother. Once I was weaned, I found it really hard to miss the ropes when I was so intent on finding the best food patch and sticking with it, twisting and turning all the while. Often I would brush against a rope running from the bottom to the surface. Usually it would just glide by, but sometimes I would get hooked up in it. 
I t learned to stop and back off, although the temptation to twist and turn and thrash was sometimes irresistible. I picked up a few minor scars. When it happened, my calf had been weaned for less than a year, so I was still skinny and hungry all the time. I had found a really good patch of food. I can't see where I was. I ran into some fairly light line, but before I knew it, I was tangled up. I had it in my mouth, over my blowhole, and tightly wrapped around my left flipper. I'm ashamed to say that I panicked. I twisted, turned, rolled, thrashed, and charged around like a crazy whale. I was able to get the trap hooked on a rock and broke that off, but I was still left with an ugly mess of rope. I could feel all the knots and twists. Every time I swam, I felt fresh stabbing pain, especially around my left flipper. I could see the rope cutting into the flesh and eventually I felt it start to cut into the bone. My left blowhole was becoming increasingly useless. I carried that rope around for weeks and months. January, 2005, my left flipper felt like it was dead. Lice had spread out around my blowhole and left flipper. I was losing all that beautiful fat I had been laying down for my next calf. I felt desperate. The last thing I remember was heading south to warmer water as I was getting really cold with no fat between the water and myself. So that's one whale story. This graph tells the story of the last 20 years for the species. Uh, there were maybe 260 or thereabouts in 1990 and gradually in spite of ongoing mortality, uh, the, the population the species was able to grow up until about 2010. Since then, it's been plunging again. And our job is to figure out how to help the management of this uh, species through uh, changing the way we look at the problems that they're facing and the priorities of biodiversity and, and maintaining the fisheries, maintaining the shipping, and how this can all work together. So another piece from the book here, again, from the preface. Over the past millennium, the North Atlantic right whale has only just avoided extinction, first from deliberate hunting and now inadvertently from fish harvest, harvesters and mariners. We've reached a tipping point. The right whale species cannot continue to withstand the mortality and morbidity it suffers from fishing gear entanglement and vessel collision. We must cons also consider what each individual is going through as it struggles with persistent rope entanglement. To solve the problem, we need to have the understanding, commitment, and optimism to carry through with what has to be done by fundamentally changing fishing and shipping practices. But we also need to make these changes in ways that are sensitive to the lives of the humans that work in vessels at sea and harvest seafood. Both industries have already borne substantial costs in the name of right whale conservation with inadequate results. Right whales are a special example of mammals that have evolved to thrive in an unforgiving environment and are specialized in diverse and remarkable ways to exploit specific aquatic resources and environment. We must become the same. The challenge is to find solutions that are sustainable both for whales and for humans dependent on these marine industries. And further on in the book, the missing link is consumers who do not know enough to demand a seafood product that is caught in a manner that protects whale populations and shields individual whales from the major animal welfare concern that rope entanglement entails, but also maintains viable and sustainable trap fishing industries. Were we to take the perspective of our grandchildren 50 years in the future, we might respond to our current actions in one of two ways. Firstly, how could they have all been so short-sighted as to demand affordable lobster and crab rolls and cheap shipping of goods from overseas, despite the fact that they knew that the North Atlantic right whale species was headed for extinction? All that we have now are the bones of a few skeletons hanging in museums up and down the east coast of North America. There's a mother calf there hanging in the whaling museum in New Bedford, just, just saying. Finally, or, or alternatively, Finally, they all saw that there was a way for whales, fisheries and ships to coexist. It just took some legislative, regulatory and political honesty and fortitude, enforcement of existing regulations, government investment, compromise, industrial ingenuity and consumer education. As a scientist, I know that it is beyond urgent that we introduced much more widespread measures to mitigate large whale trauma caused by vessels and fishing gear. As a veterinarian, I see the long, often drawn out trauma to individual right whales caused by ropes from fishing gear is utterly unacceptable. Do we all have the individual and political will to make it right? 
government regulations regarding how many animals can die each year are not being enforced adequately. The balance of political power between the seafood industry and the conservation and animal welfare lobbies is understandably heavily skewed to support the coastal communities that depend on the seafood industry for bringing cash flow to the region. Nevertheless, fishermen have been burdened and fatigued by years of whale conservation driven mandatory gear modifications, while the problem of whale trauma has continued to get worse. If the government fails to make its regulations work for either the fishing industry or the whales, what can we as individuals do? So, what you can do is support the, the variety of ways in which we know what, what has to be done for these guys. And I'll talk a little bit now about the entanglement problem and how it can be seriously reduced. So, what we've got here is a sketch of on the left of the status quo and on the right is removal of the end line out of the water column and replacing it with acoustic pingers that uh, talk back and forth from the vessel and any other vessel in the area so that the location of the gear can be communicated so others will not set gear over it or drag through it and the fisherman who owns the gear can retrieve it and the law enforcement can also inspect as required. So recently, another section from the book, recently my colleague Mark Baumgartner and I helped set up a series of workshops to promote on-demand trap retrieval. The challenges for such a technology include making it compatible with a profitable fishery, efficient as well as safe, and able to fulfill the tasks of trap retrieval and location required by all interested stakeholders. One type of system releases a coiled bag or spooled rope from the trap that floats to the surface, allowing the trap to be retrieved in the traditional manner with a hydraulic hauler. Another type of system which raises the traps by inflation of a lift bag uniquely avoids the need for any retrieval rope at all. However, the industry is heavily though not entirely entrenched in current practices, citing unbearable costs, inefficiency, and fishermen safety as concerns about on-demand technology. So here is a photograph of a local lobster boat working out a sandwich mass, uh, which has been using this kind of on-demand retrieval gear for a number of years now. And it's a couple of engineers from uh, the both the federal government and also one of the one of the gear manufacturers testing gear last year in um, in Cape Cod Bay. And with support from SeaWorld and others, we've been working with these fishery engineers and other NGO colleagues and commercial fishermen to deploy and refine these systems. This work's been going on in the Gulf of Maine. In Canada, it's actually further down the road than we are. They would have been fishing commercially with ropeless gear this, this last spring if the supply of traps had been better. They've now got the traps and ready to go for next year. And you may have been hearing about the back and forth with regards to closures that are only open to on-demand gear, both in the, in, in the Gulf of Maine and offshore Maine, which got a green light again yesterday so far, but also in and around Cape Cod Bay uh, for the 2022 season of closure that would essentially start to enable access back into an otherwise closed area. So in summary, what, what if you read the book, you'll find that what, where I'm going with all of this is that consumers should push their political representatives to demand ethical shipping and fixed gear fishing practices. Or the alternative is that socioeconomic priorities of the communities that rely on those industries and the demand for their products to be as affordable as possible will bring the North Atlantic right whale species to extinction in a few decades. My lofty goal is to change our priorities as a society. We have the laws to protect the species, but not yet the will. It all really depends upon what, what we care about, what are our priorities, but can we get a mutually sustainable uh, solution to the conflicting demands? So with that, I'd like to say thank you to more people that I can list here for sure, but my home institution, the Organo Foundation paid me to write the book, hundreds of my friends and colleagues that I've worked with for 40 years on and off, but also the Chicago University Press with Joe Clamey, my editor, Norma, my copy editor, and Nick Lilly, the publicist, and tonight's host, Annie Bedford William Museum. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank hey. you for that wonderful talk. That was such a pleasure. Um, 
I'll just note for attendees, please uh, direct your questions into the chat and I'll read them aloud so that uh, we can have Michael respond. Um, so I'll just wait a minute in case anyone has. Here we go. Okay, so we have a question from Stephanie Stack. Can you speak more to ropeless gear? The technology seems to exist, so why isn't it being used widely? Okay, well, if you're a commercial officer fisherman, it's illegal to use ropeless gear right now unless you have an experimental permit from, from the agency that oversees the area, simply because you know fishing without a buoy has in the past been a criminal offense. So, you know, there are all kinds of legal and practical um, economic barriers to ropeless fishing, but that has been slowly eroding away as we've been able to put gear in the hands of fishermen. So the practical side of it, uh, the, the system that we've used the most is, is made in um, Wareham, Edge Tech, and they went with fishermen, okay, how's this gonna work for you? And that's how most of the different manufacturers have been doing the same thing, which is hand in hand, iteratively going back and forth between fishermen, boat, manufacturer, engineer, government, and back and forth. And over the last couple of years, it's been really fascinating to watch, you know, the plasticity of the systems as they've been evolving to work better. Uh, so there's the, the functionality is still definitely in, in process, but, you know, the systems have done well in deep water, shallow water, bad weather, good weather, some, some benefits to it, such as there's a lot of drag from the end line. And so in, in heavy weather, the swells move the gear and tumble it around, but the gear doesn't move around nearly so much if, if there isn't any rope up into the water column, for instance. There's some management of where you're fishing, so folks are less able to follow the guys that are making all the money. So in some ways, the crypsis is, is, is a valuable thing as well. The economics, it, it's evolving. Uh, we have a consortium every year where we talk about this. And this year, um, one manufacturer from California who has a timed release system is planning on evolving that into an acoustic release. And his cost is significantly less, if any reckons he can keep it there than some of the current gear. So, you know, it's it's premature to really sort of throw it out to, because it's too expensive. And it, it is certainly going to be a major problem, but I do believe that it's the way forward there. And, and legally, you know, experimental fishery permits are being applied for and in hand in some situations. So it's, a, it's all a matter of detail, but fundamentally, I do believe that it's, it's, it's very working. There are a couple of follow-up questions specifically about this um, from Bonnie Gretz. Is there concern about noise from the pingers on the ropeless gears since that has an impact on cetaceans? Right. These pingers only ping when talk and talked to. And so once once you've done some ranging on it, it's it's then quiet. Battery life, you know, dictates that you should be very conservative in the noise. And you know, echo sounders are pinging all the time. It's a, it's not a quiet environment in the first place, but I'm not the acoustician to answer that question, but it is a question that's been asked a lot and thought about a lot. And it's it's a concern, but I, I don't think it's a, it's a game stopper and it just needs to be managed. This is another question about the ropeless gear um, and the cost associated. So um, Gerald Beetham is asking, it seems clear that governments, federal and state should subsidize the cost to fishermen, much like they subsidize fossil fuels. Can we, what can we do to get the governments to recognize this need? Great question. And I agree entirely. Um, the, the challenge is to give you a, a really solid answer as to how to deal with that. But ultimately, the lobby of the ethical consumer has to become a real force, an economic force in terms of, you know, supporting the groups that are trying to make this work. There are a number of NGOs, uh, Well Dolphin Conservation, I4, and Mainers supporting the right whale and all kinds of different 
ways that you could give your charitable dollar, but ultimately it's your consumer dollar that really matters. And, you know, seek out, um, bang on the door of the lobsterman who's fishing ropelessly and say, I want to buy your lobster and do that globally. And, you know, that's from, that's from the entanglement point of view. From the, the vessel collision point of view, again, um, it's, it's a question of having our elected representatives understand what we care about as ethical consumers. And this is the challenge that has always struck me as I've, I and many others have failed to really communicate. But picture this. So you've got um, an industry that entangles mammals, say dogs or pigs, and the industry activity happens on a city street. And it takes six months for those animals to die. Is that industry going to be in business? I don't think so. And so, you know, I've said this for years and, you know, it's unfair analogy, but it's really not actually. Uh, it's out of sight, out of mind. Now, the question is, to what extent is an individual uh, fisherman um, actually torturing a whale? Negligible. But from the whale's point of view, it's every day. And that's one of the other challenges is that there's so much rope that any one piece of rope isn't going to be a problem, but in the aggregate it is. And so many fishermen and so few whales, 99% of them don't ever see one. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge mis mismatch of perspective and, and um, challenge, but it, it is what it is. We've got some some questions that spring off of that. Uh, Anne Kirschman is asking, um, how do consumers identify lobsters that are harvested with ropeless gear versus those that are not? It's not that yet, um, but the consumer can ask for it and demand it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the dolphin safe tuna thing is is a reasonable paradigm to follow. Mm -hmm. And you know there's going to be a point where there is enough of a product stream that that can happen. Uh, but obviously certification of that and most of these uh, sustainable certifications are, are industry funded by default. And that's, that's the problem. Uh, another side to this, um, Alexander Friedman is asking, would it be effective to invest in disentanglement teams to help the whales right. uh, since ropeless technology is still in development? Well, they, they, the whole concept of disentanglement has been around for 40 years. It started in Newfoundland in the 1970s with humpback whales getting caught in cod traps and was, was then developed for um, mobile entanglements, humpbacks and right whales, set of coastal studies in Provincetown. And it's a very valuable individual um, stopgap, but it's not prevention. And for every animal that gets disentangled, there's probably 10 entangled animals that aren't. Um, and it's, it's not a solution. The folks doing the disentanglement would love to be out of that line of their work, for sure. So it's, it's, it's palliative, but it's not fixing the problem by any means. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Absolutely, they should. They're risking their lives to do so, but it's something that isn't going to fix the problem. Uh, Cynthia Smith takes us in a different direction um, and notes, first, congratulations on the book. And can you expand on the statement, anthropogenic trauma demands anthropomorphism? Uh, I think uh, I too wrote that down. It's, it's such a great frame. Um, Cynthia expands, do you think we need to adjust our frame of mind when it comes to how veterinarians and scientists communicate with the public about the animals we are studying and trying to protect? Hi, Cynthia. Um, yes, I do. Um, it's, I haven't really thought this through because I'm still sort of in the throes of bearing my chest, as it were, as an anthropomorphic veterinarian. And it's, it's challenging, but I do believe that scientists as well, and you know, I, am, I call myself a veterinary scientist, uh, do have a very deep responsibility to share what they know. And 
you know, okay, maybe I went overboard a little bit with those postscripts, but I don't think I did really. I mean, they're based on the historical facts of each case um, with an interpretation of what it means to be a functional right whale. And, you know, the first time I read that passage in um, the group of colleagues, there was, there were no questions because everybody was crying. And I think that's, um, that answers Cynthia's question, actually, that, um, you know, many of us live with pets and would not want to see their pets entangled and they wouldn't facilitate that entanglement with their pocketbook. And I, I do think that we need to have a more sensitive and emotional uh, consideration of some of these, these issues, for sure. I think one of the big things that I took away from reading your book was the need for empathy and how to cultivate empathy without, as you described, that first person experience. And so you really right. provide it in a way that forces um, forces that kind of exchange. Well, I was asked earlier today why I talked about myself in the book. And I wanted to tell a personal story because I had the fortune or ill fortune of being exposed to dead whales in a number of different scenarios over my career. And, you know, I, I remember getting debriefed by a colleague after I got off the whaling ship in Iceland and how could I lend them my credibility and so on and so forth. And I didn't think I had any credibility at that time, I still don't, but it's, it's all so complicated. And, you know, am I right in drawing comparisons between explosive harpoons and entangling lines? I don't think it's the wrong thing to do, but it certainly, um, when I first started having those kind of conversations, I was warned off of that. You know, you're not going to help the anti whaling thing. Well, I think actually I might be because, you know, it's all part and parcel of a much broader question than simply some arcane um, fisheries in selected countries. There are a couple of questions that have come up here that, that seem to be <clears throat> asking similar things. Uh, Akita Barris Gomez and um, Sean Paul Velati are both asking, um, in addition to entanglement and collisions, are there other big human and environmental factors that contribute to the large scale deaths of whales? Um, that's coming from IKEA. And then Jean Paul is asking if offshore wind projects also have an impact on whale populations. Right. Well, with right whales, we've stumbled through entanglements and vessel strikes, and they, they are the things that really jump out at you. But we're certainly ignorant about other things that may be involved. Uh, the stress from noise um, certainly causes elevated stress hormones in whales. Um, harmful algal blooms uh, can be a problem, and certainly uh, there have been suggestions of both in the fossil record and, and contemporary uh, die-offs in that regard in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the wind thing, it's really hard. The absence of whales in the European wind farm habitats have meant that we really don't have much information coming from over there because they're 20 years in front of us. So what we, what we will learn over the next 20, 30 years as the wind farms start to become real on the US East Coast is, I don't know, but it's not an easy question to design experiments for or studies, observations. Is the whale not there because the food wasn't there in the first place? Or did the, did the wind farm make the food go away? Or was the noise, the vibration irritating to the whale? It's, it's a very multifactorial, difficult question to address and to, to consider. In parentheses, Akia adds a question about pollution and global warming. And I was struck by the global map that you showed that you know, the bands of habitat are really north and south. Can you talk about um, temperature rise and yeah, well, let, let, let's take the temperature story first and then we'll talk about the pollution side too. The, we haven't talked to, tonight much about food. 
but right whales need to find, as as, as the postscript said, um, you know, the, the 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 key spot where they can get really down and dirty and get filled up real fast. And that changes with oceanographic um, details and very fine details. And so any thermal regime change will result in fairly dramatic changes in where the whales want to be. And so one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years has been the warming of the Gulf of Maine, resulting in the Gulf of St. Lawrence becoming a much more favorable place to feed than it used to be. They've always been going up there, but not in the numbers that they currently are. So that um, directly interacts with the vessel and entanglement problems because where there have been, uh, albeit insufficient conservation measures taken in US waters where the whales were and in the Bay of Fundy, then you know the, the level and the detail of the conflicts that are now going on with serious results in terms of mortalities in 2017, 2019 in the Gulf of St. Lawrence are um, new ground that have to be studied and recorded and debated and, and heard about and acted on. And so the, it, there's very significant interaction and complications between climate change and the other aspects to the health and wealth of these whales. In terms of pollution, um, North Atlantic right whales feed, one of the few smart things they do is they feed low down in the food chain. So they're not like killer whales that are going to be stacking up the PCBs and other long persistent uh, lipophilic compounds that are, are a real problem for their health. So I think relatively speaking, the North Atlantic right whale is less uh, exposed to a chemical threat. We don't really know much about microplastics and what that does to their feeding capacity. And it may be much worse than we think. We just don't know. Going back to thinking about the need for study and discussion with um, new feeding patterns in um, uh, for North Atlantic right whales, there are two questions here that are about kind of um, public opinion and policy making. So Catherine Duff asks, at the policy making level, do you see experience consensus or discourse? Um, they're curious if policymakers are in agreement with changes that must happen. And then a second question that's more about public awareness. Um, Barbara Scappa says public awareness is good in Florida, Georgia, and Massachusetts, where there are right whale festivals. So I think there are two questions here about um, the kind of uh, public opinion that you see, and then also where policymaking opinion rests currently. Right. Well, I've never worked for a government, so I don't understand the pressures that the folks that do are facing, and I'm sure they are very severe because, um, for instance, in the US, the National Marine Fisheries Service is charged with maintaining a thriving fishing industry and protecting endangered species such as the North Atlantic right whale, fundamental conflict. And then the elected representatives have opinions and they listen to the voters. So that's complicated. It's really complicated. And, and, it, and it essentially is the root of the problem. It's the axle. It's the axis of the problem. Because how do we insert these concerns that I've been raising tonight into that debate in a way that is uh, ethical and valuable and sustainable for, for the various parties? So, you know, if, if I was the Senator for Maine, I would obviously be looking very closely at what these um, policies are in terms of my constituents, it's nature of politics. Um, if I was the veterinarian for right whales, I would be looking at something very different. So, but also with understanding and sympathy for the challenges faced of the stakeholders. Absolutely, you know, I always try to think these things through, assuming I have a lostman or a ship captain who's my 
neighbor because they are essentially. So that was the, the policy side, the public opinion side of it um, is critical to shifting the policy balance. And folks like Barbara in Maine are really important in that regard. And, you know, that's why I wrote the book. Is the book popular enough? Was it too geeky? I don't know. But um, I think we all have a role to play in sharing what we know, what we care about and what is important. And really, it's what we care about that will shift the balance. And boy, are we in a complex time in terms of all of that. You know, we start thinking about the kaleidoscope of what we've been through in the last two or three years, politically and public health. And the interface between those two, uh, it's, it's depressing times. It seems like it's, it's negotiating what seems like a conflict between capitalism and conservation, when if there's a way to spin or flip those, they don't have to be antagonistic forces. No, and ultimately, um, taken to its absurd limit, when we've taken care of all the biodiversity, it's all gone. And we're just left there looking pretty darn stupid. So we've got to wake up sooner or later, whether it be climate change or fossil fuel extraction or farming or whatever, you know, fishing. Uh, it's, um, we, we got to wake up. There's a great question from Matthew Leslie that touches upon this. Um, uh, Matthew says, great to see your face. Congrats on the book. As a conservation scientist, I appreciate your struggle with the objectivity advocacy divide and I'm thankful for your bold step toward advocacy. How do you approach teaching students to toe the line of objectivity and making positive change in a world with so many wounds? Well, happily, well, I, I'm at a career stage that, I, that that isn't necessarily a personal challenge. And so, and, I, and I've been in a research institution without a lot of students to teach other than graduate students. And the graduate students I've worked with, I think um, they kind of buy my line. I had a conversation with one recent graduate student I was working with. And she thanked me for the attitude that I instilled in her, which was one of, um, you know, do the fundamental science and do it really well, but do think about the consequences and the application thereof and um, carry through with the, the implications of what your good fundamental science did. And so I guess my response to Matt is um, tell them to do good science, but tell them to tell the story. We have a number of uh, notes of praise in the chat that I'll leave you to read later. There are some other questions that continue um, the kind of conundrum of lineless uh, fishing solutions. Um, one asking, is there GVT financial incentive for safe lobster fishing technology to make it affordable? Um, can, can you say that again? Uh, so one, uh, Derek McDonald is asking, says we have GVT financial support for solar energy. Yeah. Is there such a thing as GVT financial incentives for safe lobster fishing technology? Well, there certainly are programs within the federal government in the US that could be used for subsidizing the development of rope fishing. Absolutely, that, that's been stated. Um, whether it, it would actually um, prove to be successful and practical and viable, but the programs are there uh, to potentially do that. Yeah. And then Ashley Barrett Club um, asks about uh, aquaculture programs as alternatives. Alternatives to right whales? Come on, Ashley. Alternatives for fisheries. Alternatives for fisheries. Um, yeah, well, 
I don't think you can culture lobster. And, you know, the, the lobster, I mean, it's, it's a complicated mix. I mean, lobster's a luxury food at this point, but the act of being a lobsterman is not a luxury. You know, these guys work really hard and it's dangerous and so on. So, and aquaculture has all of its own string of problems. If you go down the coast of Chiloe Island in the Gulf of Corcovado in Chile and look at the wasteland that follows aquaculture in terms of eutrophication, uh, aquatic animal disease. Mm -hmm. I think we're going there, whether we like it or not, simply because um, the wild fisheries have been largely overexploited. And so we'll be there anyway, um, with its own suite of entanglement problems too, I'm sure. Not to advertise an alternative title, but The Secret Lives of Lobsters is also an excellent book to learn more about the problems of lobster aquaculture. We have another question that's come in here. Uh, well, a comment more, uh, again, from Bonnie. Um, I appreciate very much your advocacy for these whales. They deserve to be known as individuals, and this will help people to advocate for them. Well, thank you. Yeah, it gets really hard when you may have known the animal as an individual in the field, but even if you haven't, um, you walk down the beach and there's a dead whale and you may have been involved with it to help disentangle it. We sedated a few animals. Um, I pulled the trigger on one, one sedation dot that didn't do well. And you know, the, the responsibility of trying to help this animal but actually hindering it is really tough. Um, but yeah, telling the individual whale story. I mean, it was once said by a colleague, Phil Clapham, that the way to save an animal is to give it a name. And, you know, Kiko was that killer whale that was free willy that landed up um, having a sad, sad ending in the end. But um, there was an enormous amount of money spent on that one whale um, because of her name. And most of these right whales, some of them have names. Um, Many of them just have numbers, but they're still individuals. And after, well, actually, really, the first right whale that I was involved in was an animal in Cape Cod Bay. Um, I forget the name now, but anyway, as I filled up the dumpster with the skeleton to send off to the museum in Western Massachusetts to um, clean it and display it. It was the first time I'd realized that I was, I was actually disposing of an animal that was potentially one of the last of the species. And that was very heavy and it doesn't get any better. Um, staccato was the whale I was thinking of. And really that was the first, first right whale that I, I, I got intimately involved with. And especially the staccato was hit by a ship, but the animals that are hit with rope and you know you land up writing a report getting your head inside the animal okay fine so it got entangled here and did that and it cut down into the bone and the bone started to fluoresce with new new florid bone proliferative lesions so that it would try and slow down the pain and, and make it more stabilized and so on as, as you you write a take you know two or three thousand photographs and you write a hundred page report just really documenting all the changes that, that happened to this animal. By the time you've done that, two things have happened. You've got carpal tunnel for one, and for two, in manipulating all those photographs, and two, your head is like, it's PTSD, it's really rough. And I'm not the only one to say that. Lots of my colleagues who you know go through this, and they personally have very serious you know, issues with all of the way they've had to think their way through to write an honest and solid report for the management that needs to know that, yeah, this is what killed this animal. But in the process of doing that, you know, you check the box, yeah, it was killed by a ship or whatever. 
but the, the details become really burdensome because you get to understand it and you don't want to see it again. Well, and in that documentation of trauma, it's like you're writing a biography of each of those animals. So it right. seems like those are the kind of um, postscript pieces of the book at the same time that in some ways the book is also a, a kind of biography of you in the background charting yeah. their, their, their histories. Yeah, well, you know, I struggled and, you know, to, to, to strike that balance and, you know, nobody wanted to publish a, bio, a you know, autobiography or, or memoir or whatever. And I'm, I remember I, I was trying to get a editor from the Harvard University Press. We don't do memoirs. Well, I'm not sure I'm writing a memoir, but maybe I am, maybe I'm not. But anyway, Chicago was a little bit more forgiving, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it becomes a biography of the whales as well, which I think is a beautiful. Well, fact. Yeah, it, it, uh, uh, and I think now I've seen that some of the responses to those postscripts, I might have been more aggressive with the editorial process in terms of how much um, anthropomorphism was acceptable, and I, I'm, you know, maybe maybe the kids will really get into that. So that may be book number two. Uh, Richard Zach Cliver says, um, I greatly look forward to reading your book, which just arrived. Can you tell us where your book tour will go from here? Where my book? Where your book tour will go from here. My bookstore. Tour. Where will you be speaking next? Oh, 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 oh sorry, it's tour. Um, I got a talk scheduled at Hui on the 30th of November. And I've got one going with Mystic Seaport, um, maybe a week after that, I think. I'm looking to spread out the West Coast and I'm willing to talk anywhere because I like to talk. Well, Richard is suggesting um, the American Museum of Natural History or the Smithsonian. So if there are connections there, sounds yep. like that's a... It's funny, um, I'm supposed to be doing my job. And this book, hasn't gone away, um, you know, how to be efficient in terms of dealing with um, promoting a book in our virtual world. And I'm immunosuppressed, so I'm not gonna go to bookstores and do it. So I'm doing what I'm doing now and um, making it up as I go along, really. I would hope that this uh, book is as much part of your job and its futurity is. <laughs> yeah, but projects end. <laughs> Is this supposed to? <laughs> well, are there any other final questions here uh, as we continue this conversation? Again, many, many uh, thank yous and comments coming in. Well, a whole bunch of um, erstwhile colleagues or current and past colleagues have been asking questions. Appreciate them all. So thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you join us at the museum and uh, get to have this conversation. I hope everyone will pick up a copy of the book as soon as possible and uh, enjoy reading it as much as. as yeah, as and just to say that um, supply is happily hard to find right now, but there's a second printing that's happening uh, early December. Very exciting. It looks like Jocelyn has dropped a, a link in the chat here too. Uh, if you'd like to purchase your copy, if you have not already. Megan Stolen notes, you can keep going, I'm here. I just wanted to mention that we do have plenty of copies, Michael. I did confirm with our store. So everybody who's tuning in, if you're interested, we have plenty of copies. And if not, then we will get some more when available. Great. Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, Megan Stolen notes, um, 
the book is an important step to getting more people to talk about these whales and hopes it sparks a wave of letter writing. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Well, one of the things, Michael, that I had mentioned to you when we first came together was the um, first calf of the season being spotted two days ago. Yeah. Do you have thoughts about that calf's arrival? Is that a whale that you um, are familiar with and know? I haven't heard that, that the mom has been identified. Um, last time I saw it, it hasn't been. The photographs were not really at the level of being able to do that. But there are surveys underway, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. I'm not sure the Georgia, Florida ones have started, but the Carolina ones have. And this animal was in one of the Carolinas. And so it's relatively early to have a calf, but it's great news. And the mom will be suckling it. And hopefully it'll stay out of the way of recreational and commercial vessel traffic and any kind of entanglement down there. You know, sadly, around 50% of the fem adult females that should calve have never calved. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a major problem. And my sense is that it's as much nutritional as any, anything else. And if it's like a dairy cow, if you don't get fat enough, you're not going to get pregnant and no milk. So that's the challenge. You now we could talk about this all night. <laughs> I think that will conclude our program. So thank you for tuning in. Um, if you didn't catch this, this is on our calendar. Um, and you can purchase right from there as well. The link is embedded in the calendar entry. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Naomi. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in. Well, thank you. Good night.